Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. I'm uh, I'm rolling my state fair thing out because I'm about to take a state tour of the crab cake that's going to begin at Fadley's uh, and at Costas. We're going to be back at state fair next month. I think it's going to be our first back in action, outdoor, socially distanced thing. Don Moeller's putting that together uh, to honor the folks out in Catonsville to get ready for the 4th of July parade. I think they've already got the chairs. I think the back of this has the, uh, yeah, I think it has the chairs on it. But uh, so cheers to State Fair to all our sponsors. I promised our friends at Wise Markets that we would be having wise conversations. I call them intelligent conversations. So I, obviously we're spanning the globe here. And, you know, I get a lot of mail. Most of it's hate mail, um, you know, uh, at various points. There's Twitter, there's Facebook, there's correspondences. There's people I know from high school. I've had all these musician buddies on this week uh, talking music. We're doing the draft and we're trying to get some baseball in where we can. Uh, we're going to have the, the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness. But all of this stuff in my life the last couple of months, I've just found old stuff. And um, a professor from Penn State, wrote me a very nice letter a couple of years ago. I think I responded and said, thank you. It's easier when it's on email. It's kind of old fashioned to send a thank you note, you know, the old fashioned way. Although I still, I still keep a pen on my desk of four colors uh, and, uh, you know, various things when I have lists and stuff. Right. So um, I would say this, this guy wrote me a nice letter. He's obviously someone that listens to the show. I don't really know him well, but I feel like I know him a little bit through the internet and certainly fits right into why shouldn't I have a professor of American studies at Penn State on this show where I told Don Moeller, and it's only a shame he's not here. I was going to bring him in, but I figured I don't need two teachers. One teacher's enough right now that I told Moeller three years ago I wanted to make Baltimore Positive a giant social studies course so that we could re-educate some people about some things they maybe missed with Mr. Schley in seventh grade or Miss Simpkins or Mr. Zentz or my social studies teachers in middle school. Dr. Charlie Kupfer is the associate professor for American studies at Penn State uh, that, you know, I'm not going to hold it against you. You're in Pennsylvania because you are a Baltimore sports fan. You apparently dig my work, which makes you a little demented, which is probably why you're in education. It is a pleasure to have you on. I love the Orioles thing behind you, dude. What's going on? Well, Nestor, I have a, a, a long relationship with you that you don't even know about, because when I was in graduate school years and years ago, back in uh, Austin, Texas, a friend of mine gave me a gift subscription to your old Budweiser sports report. And somewhere back here, I got pictures of you in that, in that blazer that you used to wear. So, wow, me and John Dow and George Acton. Yes, yes, yeah, very so much so. I've, I've, I've been a Nestor fan a uh, long time. And uh, obviously, I like you. I love Baltimore sports. Uh, I love what you do. I think you're the teacher. Um, I think what you do is really important. And uh, you've taught me a ton, but uh, to be honest, uh, I, I, you know how it is when you're in media, um, you, you put yourself out there and, and everything from your, uh, your great work on behalf of your wife and everybody else with, uh, with uh, uh, in need of marrow transplants, I've followed your career and I think I know sincerity when I see it. I think I know the real deal when I hear it. And uh, that's you, my man, that's how I feel. I appreciate that. It's very, very kind of you. I, I didn't bring you on for all that. I actually brought you on because I started to think about like people scaling the capital. And, you know, I grabbed your letter right around that period of time. Like I just, I was going through stuff and nice letters people have sent me and I don't shred that kind of stuff, but I'm scanning it now, right? Like I'm trying to like sort of eliminate, I, I sort of famously auctioned off a lot of my rock and roll stuff last week uh, just because it was it was just time. I'm 52 and my wife and I are going to sell our place. We live here. This is our view for real. I put this up for you because I figured like you would want to talk some football and some baseball and like, but I would want to talk social studies. So I'm, I'm guessing you're bored with social studies and I'm not bored with sports, but I'm trying to figure out the value of it, right? Like I'm getting to this point now where my team won the Stanley cup and the owner lied to me about bringing the cup here. Right. I'm at this point where I've all I've ever done, all I've ever done is try to to love this baseball team. And it's still a fiasco. It's a disaster. Right. So we're on the other end of the plague now. And these folks here are trying to find 
a completely new audience. They're trying to find new fans, something that these people over here have completely ignored. They've ignored their old fans. I'm, I live two blocks away. You know, if I shut, shut the light off and I spin the camera, you'd be looking at the empty stadium. I'm looking at the other direction right now. Um, so, you know, I've been through all of this, but I'm trying to figure out how it relates to the city. Because I'm sure like if you, you read Purple Rain, I wrote that in 2001. I'm 32. I had been on the radio for 10 years. I had bought a radio station. I had been syndicated. I had had a child at 15. Uh, I had lost my football team when I was 15 and my child was born the same year. Never thought that I'd go to a football game with my kid again. Then we win a Super Bowl. And to me, the, 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 this is one miracle, but the football stadium in the lifetime of me just being on the radio has been a, a modern, it was a miracle that we got a football team. If you knew the politics, the money, the league, Jack Kent Cook, like all of these things that have happened. But the one thing that's really happened that's disturbed me as I walk through Baltimore is the city has been diminished in, in this century through politics, through Bad leadership through. There couldn't be more right. I was in Baltimore. More um, in. Sorry, Nestor. I think we're fading in. And oh, go out. ahead. You're, yeah. you, you got the floor. Go for it. <clears throat> you know, I was in college when the Colts moved, and uh, I saw what that did. I was within walking distance of the stadium. I was at the last Colts Oiler game. Um, you know, everything that you're talking about is tracks with my life too, and. If you had said to me that night, hey, Charlie, you know, down the road, you're going to live uh, close enough to go to Ravens games. I'd have said, what's the Ravens? And you're going to have a kid, one of whom is uh, uh, a fanatical Ravens fan. And it's going to bring you and your son tons of joy to watch so far two Super Bowl championships. I wouldn't know what you were talking about. It was inconceivable. And I, I sometimes sit back and I think as, as awful as those 13 years without football or NFL football were, I can't imagine how blessed we got with, with a football team that does it properly. And then if you had said to me back in 1983, you know, the Orioles are going to lose their way and, uh, and it's going to take, well, who knows how long for them to really find their way again. Again, I wouldn't have believed you. It seems like Baltimore's fate is we get the mountains and we get the, dip, the deep valleys and we don't get a lot of stability in between. On a civic standard of 30 years for what the baseball stadium did for tourism, for the harbor, I live at the harbor, obviously, I walk to the harbor every night, um, in lifting cities, I mean, you teach about American studies, it's the, probably the reason, the backbone, the reason I brought you on, but Part of my pimping all of this all these years to you and everyone like you was that I felt like it was important that it said Baltimore on it, right? Like, and that was th one thing that really pissed me off with the old man with the baseball team. It's something that David Modell felt immediately, which is why he put the B on the helmet. And, you know, and I talked to his grave, you know, uh, in regard to what that represented and why that was important. And the one thing my father, if he came back from the dead over gardens of faith, he died in 1992, having seen the stadium happen. Uh, he didn't see the football team happen, but he, he, he would, he would just be amazed that Washington got a team and that they have become a, a baseball hotbed now of all things where that team's going to do well the next two decades, this thing here, I don't know how it's going to do well. You know, like I, I keep asking the question, if you don't want me to give you my money, my name's Aparicio. I live two blocks away. I've dedicated my whole freaking life. Like everything I've ever built was to make sports and Baltimore awesome and relevant. And, and if you don't want me, what, what do you, then you don't, what do you want? Who are you trying to attract? And that's a question I think for the sports leagues in America in general, like moving forward as to what it used to be and what arenas and stadiums and all of that. And now, um, you know, we're at the point where we have two, three decade old stadiums are getting to that point now. And we're trying to figure out what the future looks like, um, how these things build infrastructure for cities and economic stimulus and development and all that stuff that we always hear about when they pull an all-star game out of Atlanta, right? For political purposes, right? They say, well, it's going to cost you this. I'm trying to figure out how this brings the whole thing together because 
that was sort of the notion of sports. And certainly I've never felt the city more together than after the second Super Bowl, you know, that day right. out in the middle of the city where it really felt like it was for everyone here. Well, Nestor, I, you know, I look at this and I, I can tell you get it because of the whole be more positive um, angle that you've taken. I mean, I know that uh, people who crunch numbers will argue about, you know, added dollar impact of a stadium or a game. But the fact of the matter is it just makes living better. It makes living in a place more fun and fun is OK to have a unifying factor that we can all get around and enjoy. Exactly like you said about the Super Bowl, like it was with the Orioles in the early 80s. I mean, you know, going to college, I was going to Hopkins. I could walk up and down 33rd Street, get into the stadium very cheaply. I'd go to 40, 50 games a year. It was bliss. And I felt so proud that Baltimore had this team that was not only good, but that was smart and that did things the right way and that repped for Baltimore all around the country. You know, it was a thrill and it was it was hometown pride. And it was it was something that uh, that everybody could enjoy together, no matter what station of life you were coming from. And it is a very, very strange world we live in now when uh, a team can say, well, you know, we're going to invent a fictional place called Birdland because we don't really want to use our hometown name on our uniforms. What are you talking about? What are you ashamed of where you're from? Be proud. And I like that. Uh, I like that you carry that flag. And uh, I like that sports can and should be a part of being more positive. You said hometown pride, right? Like th that <clears throat> That was the whole notion of we're not New York, we're not Boston, we're Baltimore, we're not Washington, we're Baltimore. We didn't like the Redskins, you know, being piped in on TV for 13 years and all of those things. But hometown pride, take that out of a sports context, right? Like where I drive a very, very divided country. I was up in your state in Pennsylvania uh, recently seeing these roadside shrines to Donald Trump. You know, like it is really a divided place we live in right now and hometown pride and American pride and what is mine and what team I'm on and whether I'm in the Penn State tribe or whether I'm in the Eagles tribe or the Steelers tribe or the Orioles or the Washington football team. I'm not allowed to say the other thing anymore. Um, I, I, you know, the American studies part of what you do. What do you do? What, what courses do you teach and what? What's on the mind of a young person at Penn State right now while they're wearing a mask and watching people climb the Capitol and have no accountability for that? I think young people are always looking for a clue as to how things got to be the way they are in almost every walk of life. Pop culture, politics doesn't really matter. I think they're always grateful when you can put something into context. I know this past semester I've been teaching a class called Sports and Society. And I had the class read uh, William Gilday's book uh, about uh, when the Colts belong to Baltimore. And it was a sort of angle. It was less about football for us than about looking at how people bonded over an institution. And it tells the story of a dad and a son and a mom and the football team is part of their uh, method for, for knitting their family together. Uh, and then he pans out a little bit and he talks about how the rest of the town, which was in the process of moving from racial segregation to racial integration, could make sense of that by coming together and rooting for Lenny Moore and Johnny Unitas at the same time. And that's and, no different, by the way, than Friday Night Lights in Odessa, Texas, not at or, all, or not Tuscaloosa at all. Saturdays with the ball coach and like that's or rallying around a NASCAR race or a horse race or the ass, you know, the ascots at Oxford, you know, whatever, whatever that is, that's what brings people together. Right. It and that's what brings up a, a town together that says we're from here, not from right. there. Right. And, you know, sometimes you'll talk to people who will say, oh, the country's become homogenous and it really hasn't. You know, if you go around, you recognize how different one place is to another. But what has become homogenous is stuff like, you know, mass advertising and mass culture. And I think while people appreciate that and like it, they also really crave the authenticity that comes from learning about a place and why a specific place is different. And you know what? God love Baltimore. Baltimore is a different kind of place. I tell people, look, uh, you know, this place didn't give rise to Barry Levinson and John Waters by accident, man. This place craves and prizes and understands 
difference, eccentricity. Uh, I could use diversity. It's a, it's a bit of a buzzword, but Baltimore likes things and people that are a little bit different. And it's fantastic. And you get a kind of funky vibe in Baltimore, all sorts of ways that you don't get in lots of other places. And Baltimoreans know it and they love it. And that's why they live there. And that's why they're proud to be from there. And if an institution that used to be core to the Baltimore sense of itself starts to sort of wander away and say, we're gonna become a little more generic so that people don't associate us with the place that we're from. Man, that is a strange and upsetting and peculiar business model from where I sit. Well, there needs to be vision and visionaries, right? And um, we lost Fraser Smith this week and, and yeah. I would love to pay tribute again to him. Uh, I, I would encourage anyone to go watch any of the episodes of Baltimore Positive that Don and I did with Fraser. Um, but a lot of it was about Governor Schaefer. And, you know, Fraser was the ultimate historian of William Donald Schaefer, right. um, whose, you know, statue sits at the literally at the, the front of my building. Um, and, you know, and I knew uh, Governor Schaefer. He was on the show with me at various points. You can go to Baltimore Positive and poke around and find him and John Moog telling old stories at the barn over crabs or a crab cake. Maybe it was an oyster in his case because he was the governor at, the, at, at that point, had been the governor. But um, where the vision, where the money, I mean, I see what Mark Weller's trying to do in Port Covington, and I see yep. the people shooting at him, right? I right. see what people that tried to do with the Hippodrome in the West Side, and people – I see – I walked through Harbor East with my dear friend Stan Jablonski, who is a Baltimorean from Dundalk. We grew up together, but he's lived in Chicago for – since I was syndicated at the turn of the century, I used to go out with him and his family then. So he comes back from time to time. His sisters don't live in the city. They live in the suburbs, so they don't come to the city other than for a football game or a baseball game. Park, come in, leave. And we walk through the city on Tuesday night. He's like, oh, my God, like this place is coming back to life. And this is from the eyes of a guy from Chicago who's just my pal. He's not – smooching up but there were families out people out commerce out the sun was out mask respectful you know but all of the wire part of that and i love me some david simon you know sure, i mean I, I love dave I, I, another quirky part of baltimore um you know i'm gonna work blue with him one day on maledicta <laughs> and it's gonna be freaking awesome um but the the reputation of when it was Cal Ripken and crab cakes and I've been to Camden Yards and my wife's family wanting to come down here on buses and see the Red Sox play and all of that to where we are now after pandemic, where I see this city as visiting Europe without having to go to Europe because it's the most <laughs> European place. I see the crab cake and, you know, I'm about to do a tour, which is, you know, if, if you've been following along, I'm going to be going nuts with that because I want to experience the state that I'm pimping because I used to pimp this and this because it said Baltimore on it. Right. And at various points has had very little to do with Baltimore <laughs> to some degree. You know what I mean? The owner yeah. of the football team hasn't been seen out in public in two years. So like I, in the middle of other than giving money away and doing TikTok videos, which is great. I love Steve, but where's the leader? Where's the governor Schaefer? Where's the visionary? What's Brandon Scott going to do besides pull down some statues? And, and I'm going to sit and have a Coco's crab cake with him and talk to him right. about this. But, but the people that are in charge now can't be criminals anymore. And the people like, you, you know, Steve Bishotti that has the football team, whoever's going to own it next, and there will be a next owner. I'm concerned about that. And whatever is going to happen with the baseball team, and I've been gravely concerned with that to the point where they threw me out, right, 15 years ago, that how does this piece together? But more than that, businesses, commerce, travel, what's going to make you bring your beautiful family down here from bucolic Pennsylvania to park your car in Fells Point, to go get an oyster, a crab cake, a beer, take a walk, stay at the Pendry, do all of these awesome things, um, and – I think there's real opportunity for my town to move on from the old reputation and move back into a place where um, we, we can grow again. And I, it's important 100%. to me. And that's why I've moved my business from sports to we need to fix the city and people like me and people connected to me better be getting a shovel. And that's just not in Baltimore. That better be happening in State College, Harrisburg, Salisbury. That's going to have to happen everywhere in the aftermath of a pandemic, four years of just horrific leadership, and and now the back end of trying to rebuild literally our country, I think. 
And Nestor, this is the time. This is the opportunity. It can happen. I mean, I'm a little bit older than you, <clears throat> and I am not a guy who falls in love with politicians. And yet I can tell you the, the excitement I felt being in Baltimore in the early 80s with Schaefer's drive and enthusiasm, I felt like, you know what, no matter what this policy or that policy or fi fixing the pop holes or painting them pink or whatever, this guy loves it here. He wants the best for this place. He wants the best for everyone in this place. And the enthusiasm was infectious. And I think it's, you know, it's right there. Sometimes I'll listen to people and I'll think, you know, that guy kind of gets it. Honestly, one of the reasons I became an enormous Adam Jones fan, not just because of his baseball excellence, but because I listened to the guy and the guy talked about community and the guy talked about forward movement, movement and vision. And I thought, this is a guy who actually gets it. And I remember sort of bookmarking it into my head. Imagine if the ownership would have gotten it simultaneously with a generational black athlete in this city. Can you imagine? That's exactly right. And that's what needs who to married happen. the daughter of a, you know, <laughs> royalty and who's now off eating some really decent sushi, from what I can tell over. That's Japan, right. You know, so that's well, right. no, I mean, we've got the tools here. We've got the component parts. We need what you're talking about, which is leaders with the vision who can put it together. And I think some of that has to be. If I say irrational, I don't mean crazy, but it's got to come from here, man. You got to feel it here. And it can't be a bunch of guys in suits sitting around looking at marketing reports and figuring out how to hit that sweet spot between the purist and the new fan. Come on, man. You got to have something that's authentic, that lives and breathes. Baltimore is authentic and it knows when something is fake. So don't be fake. Uh, Dr. Charlie Cuffer, he told me not to call him Doc. We'll just call him Prof. Uh, he's the professor of American studies. Are you in state college? Tell me how you teach these days and remotely and whatnot. And um, what what does history look like at the collegiate level in 2021? I hope it looks better than Fox News. Yeah, I can tell you. Now, I'm at the Harrisburg campus, which is not in Harrisburg, but rather in Middletown, which you think you don't know, but you do because it's where Three Mile Island is. So when I came down and I looked at the cooling towers in the moonlight and said, they're kind of pretty, I guess I really wanted that job, right? I'm close to Baltimore, which is a plus. I mostly teach graduate students because the American Studies graduate program is down here. Teaching right now is still mostly remote. It's a battle to get into the classroom, which kills me because I thrive on the human contact. Um, I think students have a better sense for what is going on in the country uh, bottom to top than we might think. I think a lot of the craziness, I think a lot of the performative politics, if I can sort of be neutral about it, I think they see right through that. And I think it's not that different from what we're talking about. I think they're looking for people who won't BS them. I think they're looking for people who won't spin them. I think they're looking for people who will be honest with them and tell them, yeah, this is what the country used to be like. And here were some good things about it. And here were some bad things about it. Here were some ways things got fixed. And here are some things that still need to be fixed. And they like that approach. So I just try to pitch it right down the plate, let them, uh, you know, take their swings at it. And uh, I always try to be honest with them. But um, liberal arts, I think Nestor, higher education is going through a big time structural reorganization. I think the price scale is crazy out of whack. It's way too expensive. The fact that students are paying full price, which is too expensive for Zoom is just insane. So I think that when all of this pandemic business shakes out, I think higher ed is gonna need to look in the mirror and say, okay, what do we offer and why does it cost what it costs? And we'll see where that goes. And then what do we get on the other end? What, what, you know, what, right. What's the prize at that point? I mean, and every day I see people sending their children to college and I'm, I'm always wondering, what's the job when they come out like and and how are we creating that and who's creating that and you know and, and seeing the aversion to progress in this country at various points in regard to energy health care you know all of these things which we'll be talking about at length this week on baltimore positive uh professor charlie cuffer is a a baltimore sport what now the sports part of you in baltimore give me a little bit of that root because i just want to understand that better i'll tell you very quickly so i lived in baltimore when i was really small My my mom was a, went to Hopkins Medical School, divorced, a single mom. She got a job out in Seattle, of all places. And in the year 1969, I was seven years old. I clicked on the sports. 
So my first team was, believe it or not, the Seattle Pilots. You saw the Pilots. Wow. I, saw, I loved the Pilots. And then we moved back east, lived outside of Washington. My stepfather worked at the uh, National Institutes of Health. And so I badgered and badgered in summer of 1970 to go to a baseball game. And there's took Ted me, Williams. Right. And I, well, they took me to Baltimore. Uh, and, oh, because and, uh, they wanted you I, to see real baseball. I well, got you. I wanted to see the Orioles and it was close to my birthday. And they, I couldn't find the pilots in the newspaper. And I go, and who do I see but the Orioles playing the Brewers? And I'm seven years old, and I'm just turned eight, and I'm looking at those guys, and I'm like, those were the pilots, and now they're the Brewers. And Is that I had Don this, Money? <laughs> uh, well, Davey May won the game for the Orioles with a, with a home run and then was immediately traded to the Brewers. So I learned a lot that day. And, uh, and I came away saying, you know, the grownups have made this world needlessly complex and, and strange. But I, I'm going to go with the Orioles because I remembered the cartoon bird from when I lived there, uh, even as a smaller child. So I've been all Orioles uh, ever since. I was a Colts guy. If somebody wanted to do identity theft on me, all they'd have to know is the right Oriole and Colt numbers to, to, to plug in and they could, uh, they could get it. Um, I was a, a, a Skipjacks fan in college. I went to a, pretty much every Baltimore sporting event that I could go to, Blast included. Um, and even though I've moved away, uh, we always wanted to get back closer. Uh, so when I got a job, uh, that was an easy drive, uh, to Baltimore. Where wife, were you? Did you, did you travel the world? Yeah, I was in uh, Texas for nine years, which I loved, loved Austin, Texas is a great place. Obviously I'm a music guy like you, Nestor. So that was a heck of a lot of fun. Spent three years teaching up at Michigan state, um, and then came down to Penn state. And in this job, you go where the job takes you. So. My first two thoughts were, I think I live close to the Hershey Bears. Am I allowed to like those guys now that the Skipjacks are gone? And, huh, Penn State always beat Maryland. I guess now I'm on the other end of that uh, equation. But um, So your Skipjacks thing touches a lot of nerves with me, right? Because, like, I'm still very much in touch with Jeff Amder, right? Yep. Who is, you know, Skipper's on a warpath. And so... I always sat behind him um, when, even when I was a reporter with Howard yes. Scher. Um, and I invited Howard on the show and he turned me down. He said it, he had something going. I got to get Howard on to, to tell some old on. stories. Um, Howard became my DJ partner in the 90s. We're still life or friends, whatever. I still give him a hard time about that stupid Cancun trip he talked me into. Um, <laughs> That's my plug for him. <laughs> I think I lost my train of thought when I talked about Howard in the Cancun trip here. Nestor, um, your context is rich and it is wonderful. And for people who follow you, um, and I'm a fanboy, it's a real pleasure to hear. Well, I, you know, I, I would just say this when the Skipjacks thing, for you to mention Hershey, that Jeff Amder would yell, Nestle's makes the very best chocolate so these hershey players be like what the hell are they yelling that's at right. us we're singing that's the nestle's right. theme song at the hershey players then i found that about nestle's and what they do overseas and i'm a much bigger fan of hershey by the way please don't hold it against me i love hershey pennsylvania i'll be up soon hopefully to see a concert you know one of my big regrets of the whole um pandemic was that my wife and i were going to go see hall and oats on oh, a cold yeah. winter's night at the giant arena in Hershey. They, they were and, and I'm you like, up. you know, we'll go, we'll, we'll go up to Philly and see him at the man instead in May. And then May never came. Right. So uh, I'm still, I saw cheap trick before this whole thing ended, you know, back right be, be Warner theater yep. three days before the pandemic. And I was about to see sticks sticks was playing St. Patrick's day night. I came three days. Away. I've had the whole band on this last year, though, so I'm still chasing Tommy Shaw around, but I've had everybody else on. Um, so, yeah, I'm doing a little rock and roll and I'm doing the sports thing and I'm trying to, like, find my way in all of this. But I, I think we need to bring the city back. And I think as the city comes back, it would attract better ownership for this. It would attract future good things for that. I'm not of the mindset we're getting a hockey team or that the Skipjacks are coming back or that Ted Leone just is going to bring his prized possessions up here to play overpriced preseason games that nobody wants to see. Um, but I do think about the future of the Harbor and I think about the future of the politics here and, and how we're going to live. Right. And I hope you stay tuned into what we're doing here. Come down once in a while and come in and out, teach me some American history, maybe along Anytime, the way. Anytime, you know? Nestor. My heart is in Baltimore and it always will be. And I think that there are enough people of good faith who love the place, uh, that we can find each other 
and we can, as you say, we can be more positive about Baltimore. Absolutely, hundred uh, percent. You're on the right beam. You're not far. I mean, dude, I can drive to you. I mean, we can meet in 45 minutes halfway, right? So, I mean, no, Luke I'm lives 94 percent of the way to you at this point. That's so right. He's I'm, up I'm in, in Shrewsbury. So I'm, uh, I'm 55 minutes from my mother-in-law's house, uh, uh, which is the quarry uh, right there, uh, right off of. Uh, I, uh, uh, Green Spring. I'm not going to ask if it's too far, or just the right distance. I'm not, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. Good woman, there. and I love her. <laughs> well, then, then you want to you drive fast. That's even better. That's uh, right. Last thing for you, uh, Professor, uh, it's because you are 55 minutes away from your mother-in-law and the Beltway and all that. You've had a few crab cakes, I would say, in your day. Uh, probably more than I should. Yeah. Okay. All right. Just so, if you were picking up your mother-in-law and then went to the, like grab Cal Ripken and Ray Lewis, and you were going to take them to your favorite place for a crab cake and sit down and have a crab cake or grab, you know, where, where's your crab cake place? I'm asking well, everyone. Because Jennifer, my mother-in-law's in the car, I'm going to hers, which is Jimmy's, but she okay. also like, An she liked Angelina's as well. So, uh, so, uh, you know, Angelina's was my place. So yeah, yeah. so the, the, the Angelina's style crab cake, uh, That's right. which I think Michael's uh, in Timonium and, and White Marsh, very similar. And also my dear friends, this is closer up near you, Green, uh, Green Spring, uh, Green Mount Station, excuse me, in Hampstead, yeah, yeah. where I've broadcast a million times and a million crab cakes there. His are the closest to Angelina's anywhere that I've ever had. But pretty you got to go to Hampstead to get it. So uh, pretty great. Nestor, I'm generally a nice guy, but I have a confession. The only time I've ever pulled the snob routine is when I've been down in the Carolinas or down in Louisiana and they try to serve a crab cake. Steak. And, and then I'm willing to pull out the Baltimore snob card and say, I'm sorry, wh what are you calling this? I've done it. Yeah, we've done that. We, we've talked about this. We had Max Weiss on from Baltimore Magazine, and we, we've all come to this thing. She can't kind of came up with this, but we've used it, which is it's hard to get a bad crab cake here. Yeah, it's it's, you know, and it's it's also impossible to get a good one anywhere else. Right. Like, yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of fun to let, let, let the outlanders know that, too. Yeah, I just I, I've never really done that. I wouldn't go to Austin, Texas and order your crab cake. Yeah, I would just get the barbecue. Not going to happen. I'll, we'll, we'll take you out for some barbecue. All right. Well, thank you, Doc. I appreciate you coming in. Uh, we'll fix America. We'll fix the city. And uh, I'll do it by having good social studies teachers around me. Nestor, <laughs> it's a huge pleasure. And I look forward to the next time. Professor Charlie Cup for joining us here from Penn State. Uh, that's we are is what I would say or roar for all the Penn Staters up there. Uh, another wise conversation with our friends at Wise Mark. It's also Pennsylvania based, but here in Maryland and doing it right. Uh, we're uh, raising money for MDA. If you're involved at the uh, Wise Markets, you should be shopping there. Get your rewards card. You can curbside. You can even order online. I did it myself. I don't know if I'll do it again because, like, I'm such a toucher when it comes to, like, you know, my, 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 my groceries. But uh, I would say this, round up. When you round up, you're helping the folks at MDA uh, and the kids like Alice who wants the zip line, which is something I'm going to be doing in Maryland. Next time I get the uh, professor on, we're going to go through Maryland studies. I'm looking for Maryland historians and Maryland people to teach me Maryland stuff. I'm going to do a little Maryland tour in August. It's going to be uh, – what, what do you have? Is that Baltimore Sports set? It's, it's, it's Baltimore Sports. It's a collected of uh... – volume a friend of mine put it together a wonderful guy named dan nathan and you're in here nestor in the chapter i wrote i'll tell you all about it next time. i hope it's good oh it's good okay i'll get the free the bird shirt out for that one next time we are wnst.net am 1570 towson baltimore and we never stop learning about social studies and talking baltimore positive